This podcast is brought to you by irishnewspaperarchives.com, the gateway to Ireland's great historical past. irishnewspaperarchives.com is an online archive of over 70 Irish newspapers that cover the last three centuries of Irish history. It has a really straightforward search engine that's really simple to use. I use irishnewspaperarchives.com all the time when I'm making the show. Now, as a listener to the Irish History Podcast, you can get 30% off monthly and yearly packages now at irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast when you use the coupon code POD30. So that's irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and the coupon code is POD30. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is the Kilkenny Witchcraft Trial of 1324, Part 2. This podcast is the second of two episodes on one of the most notorious chapters in the history of my home county, Kilkenny, the Witchcraft Trial of 1324, one of the first such cases in European history. Now the story of these events is almost legendary today, which is hardly surprising given the topic. This podcast aims to tell the true story behind the often told myths. Tragically, as you're about to hear, the legends and the history both end in the same dark event that took place in November 1324 in Kilkenny. But there's a long road ahead of us before we reach that point. While the previous episode set the scene for the trial introducing the key players, today's podcast picks up the story just as that trial gets underway. I would say listening to the first episode on the background is pretty important before listening to this one. Before we tuck into the podcast, I want to mention the Medieval Witchcraft Tour that I've designed to accompany these two shows. This is a once-off day trip to the 14th century that takes place on Saturday, April 20th, 2019. It's going to be a really unique experience, Each person on the tour gets their own listening device for the day. So while I'm guiding you through Medieval Kilkenny and other sites telling you the history, you'll be able to hear what they sounded like in 1324. I can't wait to show you guys this. I've created an all-in ticket which will include private transport to all the sites, a walking tour of Medieval Kells and Medieval Kilkenny, along with entry to Kilkenny Castle, the Medieval Museum and St. Canice's Cathedral. The ticket also includes a meal in Kilkenny as well. The whole day costs just €100 Euros per person, but show patrons receive a 10% discount. Tickets are restricted to just 25 people and a few have sold since the first episode came out, so don't miss out and get online now to book yours at irishpodcast.eventbrite.ie That's irishpodcast.eventbrite.ie And finally, before I kick off, I want to thank all the patrons of the podcast and everyone who has donated on my website through 2018. I'm not going to name anyone in particular this week, but I just want to say your support through this year has been integral to the podcast and it really means so much to me. To be able to work out what I do is a dream come true. So thanks very much. If you want to become a patron, it's really easy. You can just go to patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast and follow the steps there. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Now let's get to the trial of 1324. Prosecuting witchcraft trials was a tricky business in the Middle Ages. When the Bishop of Ossery, Richard de Dredd, took the decision to charge Alice Kittler with witchcraft and heresy, there were strict protocols that he had to follow. It wasn't the witch hunt, or at least not the type of witch hunt we might expect. Firstly, before anything else could be done, the Bishop first had to excommunicate Alice Kittler from the church. Then, after she'd been excommunicated for 40 days, he could get the secular authorities to issue a warrant for her arrest and the trial proper could begin. However, having uncovered what he considered a conspiracy in league with the devil, Bishop Richard Le Dredd was eager to move fast and this 40-day wait presented a major problem. He wanted to have the two principal people he suspected, that's Alice Kittler and her son, William Outlaw, 
arrested immediately. He feared waiting 40 days would only alert them to the dangers they faced. Ledred decided to dispense with this first step of excommunication and instead he wrote directly to the Chancellor of the Norman Colony in Ireland asking him to issue warrants for the arrest of Kittler and her son. He hoped that the Chancellor would overlook the fact that he had adopted a hasty approach. Now luckily for Alice Kittler, this would prove a terrible mistake on Ledred's part. Indeed, Bishop Ledred was sorely disappointed when the Chancellor replied, not only refusing the warrants, but also warned him to back off Kittler. This was no surprise to anyone acquainted with Irish politics of the day, and it seems Ledred was somewhat out of touch. Because the Chancellor in 1324 was in fact Roger Outlaw, the brother of Alice Kittler's first husband and the uncle to her son William Outlaw. Now this ham-fisted attempt by Ledred to get the Chancellor Roger Outlaw to support him totally backfired and only served to alert Alice Kittler and her son William Outlaw to the charges they faced. They then began to mobilise far more dangerous forces than the Chancellor to help them. The most significant of these was Arnold Le Puer, the steward of Kilkenny. He also wrote to Bishop Ledred, asking him not to push ahead with this case. The bishop now had received requests from some very powerful forces in medieval Ireland, asking him to stop. That would be enough to deter most people. However, a driven man, Ledred, just ignored these calls, and in the following weeks he carried out the procedures to the letter of the law, starting by excommunicating Alice Kittler from the church. Alice herself at this early stage was one of the few people not to underestimate Ledred, who still seemed to be in a very weak position, and sensing the potential danger, she fled Kilkenny for Dublin. However, Ledred still pushed ahead and excommunicated Alice in her absence. But this move provoked dangerous forces, and what might be considered the polite resistance to his witchcraft trial ended here. The case was about to break into the open, but the setting for this was most unusual. While Kilkenny City itself was the largest settlement in the county, the landscape in the surrounding region during the Middle Ages was littered with the numerous towns and villages. Six miles to the south of Kilkenny, the town of Kells was the most impressive of these. Kells in County Kilkenny was built along the River Kings and had begun life as a damp fortification built on an island in the river not long after the Norman conquest of Ireland. However, through the 13th century it had grown into a substantial town. This was helped in no small part when in 1192 the Augustinian Order of Monks had started work on what would become one of their largest priories in Ireland, a vast complex with its own fortifications. By 1324, the Prior of Kells was a man called Theobald Fitzhugh and he was trying to shepherd the Priory through what were some very difficult days. In 1317, the Priory had been at the centre of the conflict zone when the Scots had swept through Kilkenny. Indeed, the Scots army had camped at Kells while they moved through the region. Seven years later, in 1324, Fitzhugh faced another very difficult situation when the Priory found itself at the centre of the emerging witchcraft trial. Having excommunicated Alice Kittler, Richard de Dredd then moved on to her son, William Outlaw. He issued William with a summons to appear before him and then set out for the Priory of Kells. While de Dredd may have been the bishop and fully within his rights to visit the Priory, this put the monks in a very awkward situation. Since 1317, the lord of the surrounding region of Kells was none other than Arnold Le Puer, the steward of Kilkenny and a key ally of the Kittlers. Le Puer had already made his views on the matter very clear when he warned the bishop to stop the case. But by travelling to the Priory, Richard de Dredd had strayed through what was Le Puer's territory. In what must have filled the monks with dread, Arnold Le Puer, accompanied by none other, and William Outlaw, the very man Ledred was hoping to excommunicate, arrived at the Priory asking to see the bishop. While the chant of the Augustinian monks at prayer echoed through the corridors of the Priory, a fateful meeting between the bishop, Le Puer, and Outlaw began. <laughs> 
in an encounter that lasted several hours with candles burning well past midnight, the bishop was asked again to drop the charges against Alice Kittler and William Outlaw. This meeting proved decisive and a clear breaking point. Ledred refused to back down and Arnold Lapuer lost his patience, insulting the bishop and then threatening him. Lapuer eventually left the priory that night but decided to take matters into his own hands. The following day, the prior of Kells, Theobald Fitzhugh, waved goodbye to Bishop Richard Le Dredd, undoubtedly relieved that no blood had been shed, but the raised voices of the previous night's meeting did not bode well. He undoubtedly knew Arnold Lapuer to be a man of action as well as strong words, and indeed Le Dredd was still in view of the priory when events escalated. As he left Kells, he found the road blocked by heavily armed men, led by a bailiff. The bailiff approached Le Dredd, saying, Lord Bishop, we mean you no harm, but we have something to say to you which greatly distresses us, and we must carry out orders. We have been given orders to arrest and attach your person and all your goods and chattels and convey you to Kilkenny Castle. Having failed to get Le Dredd to relent the previous night, Arnold Lapuer was the person behind this move. He was hoping by arresting the bishop he would intimidate him, but he was also going to physically stop him excommunicating William Outlaw. Le Dredd would not be able to do this if he was in a prison cell. The sergeant, clearly worried about arresting a bishop, went on to say, You know the power of my Lord Arnold. I did not dare to disobey his orders. In these words, the sergeant voiced the fears Manny and Kilkenny now had. In a conflict between their bishop and a powerful aristocrat, They were caught in the middle. The bishop had extreme views, but the last ten years of war and famine were so difficult and the future so devoid of hope. Many were willing to believe the devil was in fact walking among them. However, alternatively, Arnold Lapuer was a terrifying individual. Resisting him could have terrible consequences. Having been arrested, Le Dredd was brought back to Kilkenny and taken to the castle and imprisoned. Across the city, the townspeople now held their breaths to see what would happen. Kilkenny was becoming a dangerous place and for each and every one of the townspeople, it was about to get worse. Le Puer had severely underestimated the bishop. He may not have been able to fight Arnold with weapons, but Richard de Dredd was not completely powerless. As news that Richard de Dredd was imprisoned filtered through the lanes and back alleys of Kilkenny, it was followed very quickly by deeply distressing news. Richard de Dredd had taken a drastic step of placing the entire diocese of Ossery under interdict. This effectively meant the people across Kilkenny were now locked out of the church. The clergy would effectively go on strike, with no Christian rites from baptism to burial being performed. The implications of this in the Middle Ages were terrifying. The population were traumatised, having lived through war, famine and plague, having lost loved ones, and this interdict, or church strike, now threatened their souls and the hope of seeing their loved ones again in the afterlife. Medieval people believed children who died before being baptised could not, under church rules, enter heaven, while a failure to receive the last rites before death had similar consequences. Furthermore, this was all happening now in a city where there was rumours of a conspiracy in league with the devil. In light of this, Richard de Dredd found his cell in Kilkenny Castle overcrowded with streams of people from across the diocese. This was presumably Le Dredd's intention. He wanted to mobilise the population of Kilkenny, if not in support of him, in fear of what he could do. Arnold Lapuer, watching this, grew deeply concerned and tried to stop this stream of visitors, but the constable of Kilkenny Castle threatened to resign if he was forced to keep Richard Le Dredd incommunicado. Le Dredd had found a very powerful weapon to undermine Arnold Lapuer. The steward was clearly in a bind. There was just no way he could kill the bishop in a cell in the castle. This was utterly out of the question. But there was very little doubt that Richard Le Dredd was becoming more and more powerful. He had to do something to stop this rise in the bishop's power. It was becoming clear Le Puer had not clearly thought through this move and wanting to bring what was now an embarrassing charade to an end, he offered the bishop bail on the condition he would appear before Arnold in court. Le Dredd, sensing he was gaining the upper hand, refused, saying he only answered to the church hierarchy, the king and ultimately God. 
Eventually, after 18 days had passed, and specifically the day when William Outlaw was supposed to be excommunicated, Ledred was finally released. However, he would not merely walk out the gates of the castle. Instead, every cleric that could be assembled, with a large crowd of people, met Ledred at the gates. The bishop had sent for his vestments and he emerged to lead a huge procession through Kilkenny, walking from the castle through the high town, passing through the gate that led to Irish town and eventually up to the cathedral. This procession must have been a striking appearance. The grey-clad friars of the Franciscan order, the black garbs of the Dominicans, along with a huge crowd of townspeople, clearly sent a message to Arnold de Puer and, more importantly, Alice Kittler. Le Dread was now a force to be reckoned with. On reaching the cathedral, Richard Le Dread preached to the crowd and included the words in his sermon, The noose is broken and we are free. This wasn't good news for Kilkenny. Le Dread meant he was free to prosecute the case and this would not bring peace to the town. For all those who knew Arnold Le Puer, it was obvious he would not be defeated so easily. Nevertheless, within days, Richard Le Dread was pushing forward with his case. All the while in Dublin, Alice Kittler must have been growing increasingly uneasy. But before we continue the story, I want to take a quick break. Today's show is brought to you by irishnewspaperarchives.com. Since I started making the series on the Great Famine, irishnewspaperarchives.com has been an indispensable source for the show. With over 70 newspapers, the earliest of which were printed in the 1730s. A subscription is one of the best ways you can delve deeper into your history. Newspapers are a key resource for historians and irishnewspaperarchives.com makes them accessible to everyone. The website is really easy to use and if you're too busy to spend time in libraries but love history, this is a website for you. Searches that used to take hours now take seconds and you can find whatever you're interested in from your own home no matter where you live. As a listener to the Irish History Podcast, you can now get an amazing discount of 30% off their monthly and yearly packages. All you have to do is go to irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and use the coupon code POD30. That address is irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and the coupon code is POD30. Now let's get back to the show. Not long after Richard Le Dredd had been released from his prison cell, any visitor to Kilkenny passed notices posted to the town gates. Inside the walls, the same notices could be found on churches throughout the town. They were copies of an edict from Bishop Richard Le Dredd demanding that both Alice Kittler and William Outlaw both appear before him to answer the charges levelled against them. Clearly, Arnold Le Puer's attempt to intimidate the bishop had failed. If anything, he was stronger now than he had ever been before. However, Alice Kittler and her son were by no means short of allies and in the days preceding this hearing, Le Dredd himself received a summons to appear before the royal authorities demanding an explanation as to why he had placed all of Kilkenny and the Diocese of Ossery under an interdict. While such a summons was to be expected, the fact that it was taking place on precisely the same date that Alice Kittler was due to appear before the bishop, indicated there were other motives at play. Le Dredd was also summoned by his own superior, the Archbishop of Dublin, Alexander de Bicknor, to appear before him in Dublin. Now Le Dredd refused both of these summons. The road to Dublin from Kilkenny passed through the Lordship of Carlow, where Arnold Le Puer also happened to be the steward. Le Dredd claimed he now feared for his life, if he passed through this territory, and indeed in the coming weeks there were more attempts to lure Le Dredd out of Kilkenny, which certainly made him suspicious. However, while he refused to leave Kilkenny, tensions between him and Arnold Le Puer were only ratcheted up. On April 23rd, 1324, Le Dredd barged his way into a court being held by Le Puer, and despite being warned to stay away, he provoked the aristocrat, who eventually physically manhandled the bishop. Nevertheless, Le Dredd came back again, but this time he seemed to have the measure of Arnold. 
The bishop partly trapped him by publicly asking him to take an oath to obey the church and arrest Alice Kittler, to which Arnold refused. This would haunt Arnold the Puer in the coming months and years when he himself would face heresy charges. Increasingly though, the local battle between Le Puer and the bishop was taking over the case. After more failed attempts to get Le Dread to travel to Dublin, eventually Alice Kittler's allies succeeded in doing this when Roger Outlaw, the Chancellor of the Norman colony, summoned Le Dread to appear before the Parliament in Dublin. This was not something Le Dread could really refuse to do, but he also anticipated finding a sympathetic audience, so he decided he would run the gauntlet of the 70-mile journey, which was fraught with danger in the best of times. Passing through the eastern gates of Kilkenny, the days of peaceful sleep were on temporary hold for Le Dread, as he would be passing through what was an increasingly lawless zone. The entire Barrow Valley, which he had to pass through, was now a war zone, as the Norman settlers were struggling to hold back the Gaelic Irish, pushing down from the Wicklow Mountains. In 1324, this was also an eerily silent journey. Rinderpest had killed off the cattle and oxen stocks across the country. Fields lay empty as no one could procure animals. For Le Dread, this silence can only have enhanced the fear and anxiety, given he had received a warning that there would be an attempt on his life along the route. In the words of a contemporary account, an ambush was secretly being organised against the bishop. Armed men were to attack him at a certain bridge on the road which he must travel if he must go the king's highway. While this was Le Dread's claim, there's little doubt that Arnold Le Puer would do this, and given the road to Dublin was dangerous, it would be the perfect place to kill the bishop. Le Puer could deny any involvement and simply blame brigands. Le Dread, however, took precautions to avoid the ambush, but in the 1320s, this in some ways placed him in even greater danger, again in the account from the time. Because of this, the bishop had to start his journey with very few companions and travel in great peril through deserted mountainous places which had no roads. They travelled by night through forests and marshes and hid during the day. Eventually, when they reached the Vale of Dublin and the city appeared on the northern horizon, the sense of relief among this party must have been palpable. However, Dublin was a city fitting for the occasion. It was in many ways post-apocalyptic. In 1317, pretty much all the suburbs of Dublin had been destroyed in a huge conflagration that had broken out during a failed Scots siege, and in 1324, these had still not been rebuilt. The charred beams were a bleak reminder of a better world, now replaced by one where fear and anxiety were increasingly the norm. Le Dred's message that the devil was abroad in society surely resonated with some living in this ruined city. As he approached Dublin from the southwest, his appearance must have stunned Arnold Le Puer and William Outlaw, who were already in the city, and if the bishop was to be believed, had tried to kill him. There was also a sense that momentum was moving towards the bishop. They had taken numerous steps to stop him, and nothing worked. What would unfold in Dublin now would decide the future of the case, and for William Outlaw and his mother Alice Kittler, the costs of this were immense. Heretics could be potentially executed by burning them at the stake and Le Dread certainly did not seem like a man who would adopt mild punishments if he secured a conviction. During debates and discussions over the case, Arnold Le Puer tried to isolate Le Dread by pointing out his origins as an Englishman, an interesting insight into how Anglo-Norman settlers in Ireland saw themselves by the 1320s. Arnold said, you well know heretics have never been found in Ireland. It's always been called the Island of the Saints. Now this foreigner comes here from England and says we're all heretics. However, in spite of this, in Dublin, Le Dread finally found an ally he had lacked all along when the most powerful official in Ireland, the newly appointed King's representative, or just this year, a man called John Darcy, supported him. This now transformed the situation. For Alice Kittler, it was a disaster. Her most powerful ally was the Chancellor Roger Outlaw, but even he could not ignore commands from Darcy. Darcy was also able to force a somewhat humiliating peace on Arnold Le Puer, who had to apologise to Le Dread. Le Puer himself was in no position to stand up to Darcy either. A major confrontation was already breaking out between his family and their bitter rival, Morris Fitzthomas, the Lord of Desmond. 
Violence in that summer of 1324 had already seen several members of the Le Puer family killed, so Arnold could ill afford to alienate the justiciar, John Darcy. Le Dred magnanimously would accept Le Puer's apology, although he demanded the steward of Kilkenny had to swear that he would no longer protect heretics. With little option, Arnold accepted this and the two formally made peace. But Le Dred, however, never forgot or forgave Arnold for what he had done. For Alice Kittler, for Alice Kittler, these developments were deeply concerning. Her allies were being neutralised one by one, while Le Dredd now had a hugely powerful figure in John Darcy to support him. She decided to flee Dublin, now returning back to Kilkenny, but Alice was starting to run out of options. In Dublin, Le Dredd convinced John Darcy to agree to personally come to Kilkenny and investigate the matter. And Alice, stripped of her allies, was very vulnerable. Events now began to move rapidly. Not long after she arrived in Kilkenny, word followed her that investigations were to begin into the supposed heresy and soon she and six others were named and publicly shamed. Finally it came as little surprise when orders arrived in Kilkenny from Dublin that she was to be arrested. Once inside a prison cell, Alice Kittler and her co-accused would be lucky to see the light of day again. For Alice Kittler, this proved to be the breaking point. The campaign orchestrated against her by Richard Le Dredd was relentless and rather than allow herself be taken by the bishop, she decided to flee, leaving her entire life behind her. She was aided in this by powerful friends in Kilkenny and while they arrested six poor women who were supposedly co-conspirators with Hitler, they allowed Alice to disappear from the city, after which she was never seen again. Alice's disappearance did not help her co-accused and soon the dread himself had arrived back in the city and began to question them. Eventually, a total of 12 people would be named as being involved in Alice Kittler's compact with the devil. These were Robert of Bristol, Johannes Galrusen, William Payne de Bowley, Petronella of Meath and her daughter Sarah, Alice Carpenter, Anotta Lang, Elena Galrusen, Suzuki Galrusen and Eva de Brownstone. It was no surprise that of the 12 charged, in total 8 were women and only 4 were men. Charges of witchcraft and heresy are nearly always gendered. When the justiciar arrived in Kilkenny, as he had promised, the remaining resistance to Richard the Dread crumbled. Alice Kittler was declared a lapsed heretic. This was punishable by death, meaning she could never now return to Kilkenny. Later that day, Le Dredd burned in public what he claimed to be her ingredients for her magic potions that had been found in her house. All of her possessions were confiscated. Having essentially destroyed Alice Kittler's life in Kilkenny, Le Dredd turned his deadly gaze to her son, William Outlaw. However, in this case, he faced opposition, even from the justiciar John Darcy. Eager to avoid a death sentence for a powerful and well-connected figure like William Outlaw, something of a compromise was worked out where William accepted his guilt in return for a more lenient punishment. This punishment demanded he would attend three masses every day for a year, give food to the poor and cover the roof of St Canis's Cathedral with lead. A much more serious fate awaited some of the others who had no such powerful friends. On November the 3rd, Petronella of Meath, who had been a servant in the Kittler household, was tortured by Le Dredd. Her forced confession, extracted in front of a large crowd, formed the basis of the bizarre charges Le Dredd would claim against Hitler. Petronella would claim that Hitler denied Jesus Christ, that she sacrificed animals, made potions in the skull of a decapitated robber and had sex with an incubus, a demon in physical form. This testimony was clearly the creation of Le Dredd rather than Petronella. This testimony was influenced by the trial of the Knights Templar which had taken place in 1308 with three charges that Hitler denied Christ, that she consorted with demons and that she sacrificed living animals to these demons are all strikingly similar to charges levelled against the Templars. Now this reveals the truth of the case. The dread or perhaps an inquisitor in his place asked Petronella leading questions. It's inconceivable she would have known the specifics of the Templar trial but Le Dredd himself would have. For some reason, Petronella refused the sacrament of penance and for this she was condemned to an appalling death. On November the 3rd, 1324, she was burned at the stake in Kilkenny, the first person to suffer such a fate in Ireland. William Outlaw failed to do his penance and was hauled 
before the bishop again in January 1325. Perhaps in light of Petronella's death, he had a greater reason to fear the bishop now, and after a week in prison, he carried out his penances, including re-roofing St. Canis' Cathedral with lead. This would contribute to a major collapse of the cathedral in 1332. Bishop Ledred never forgave Arnold the Puer for his role in the trial. The years after the trial were disastrous for the Le Puer family, a long-running feud between them and Morris Fitzthomas, the future Earl of Desmond, exploded into a full-scale war in 1327. The town of Kells was burned by Fitzthomas and several prominent members of the Le Puer family were hunted down and killed. Many suspected Ledred of having urged Fitzthomas into this action. In any case, the bishop struck back at Arnold at his moment of weakness and charged him with heresy in 1328. He was imprisoned in Dublin Castle, where he died before he could stand trial. He, however, suffered a final humiliation. An accused heretic, Ledred saw to it that Arnold was denied burial for several weeks. Instead, his body was kept in the Dominican Priory in Dublin, where it decayed before it was eventually buried. Richard de Dredd also accused Roger Outlaw, the Chancellor of the Colony and the Prior of the Knights Hospitaller in Dublin, of being a heretic. Even for Le Dredd, this was a dangerous move and a step too far and he would eventually back down from this charge. Finally, in 1329, Le Dredd was forced into exile from Ireland as he feared for his life. Hardly surprising given some of the powerful enemies he had made he would not return to the island until the 1350s. Remarkably, Richard Le Dredd lived into his 90s, dying naturally in Kilkenny around 1360. What exactly happened to Alice Kittler is unknown. She disappeared from Kilkenny in 1324 and was never seen again. The Kilkenny witchcraft trial was extraordinary. Le Dredd, a relative outsider to the city, who had only arrived in 1317, had brought down one of the most powerful families in Kilkenny, through what were pretty bizarre accusations. However, to do this, he relied on three underlying forces at play in society. The first of these was the horrific experiences of the people who had endured so much in the previous decade that I covered in the last episode. Understandably, people wanted answers as to why their lives were so tough, and the dread, to some extent, could provide one, bizarre as it was. Secondly, and this is something that maybe hasn't come across enough through these two podcasts, but that is the role of sexism and misogyny. Accusations of heresy and witchcraft in the main target women and often older women. But gender was key to these witch trials. Women in general in the Middle Ages were considered weak, more susceptible to temptation from the devil, and this allowed Ledred to focus on Alice Kittler. Further to this, the fact that Alice was wealthy undoubtedly made many men at the time more bitter at her. The role of gender can also be seen in the fact that eight of the twelve people accused were women and the only person executed was a woman. While the Kilkenny witchcraft trial was one of the earliest to take place, it was a stark warning for the future. In the coming centuries, there were very few trials of this kind in Ireland, but tens of thousands of people, mainly women, many like Petronella of Meath, were executed after being convicted of witchcraft and heresy. The same forces of sexism, misogyny and a deeply unstable society could be found at play in Scotland and Germany in the 16th century, England in the 1640s and then, most famously, in Salem, Massachusetts in the 1690s. If you enjoyed this show, why not join me on April the 20th, 2019 for a tour back to the world where these events took place. Over the course of the day, we'll be visiting Kilkenny Castle, where Richard the Dread was imprisoned, St. Canis' Cathedral, where a lot of these events played out, and the spectacular remains of Kells Priory, where it all started. You can book tickets at irishpodcast.eventbrite.ie That's irishpodcast.eventbrite.ie There's little left for me to do now, other than to say Happy Christmas to all of you. I'll be back in or around the third week of January in 2019 when we'll move through the final stages in the story of the Great Famine. I'll also be getting my second series, This Week in Irish History, back on track then too. Thanks so much to all of you for listening and subscribing to the show throughout the year. And a special word of thanks again to all the patrons of the show who have supported my work throughout the year and have made the show possible. I've had an amazing year making the podcast and I'm really looking forward to more in 2019.
Nolikona, and until next time, Sloan. <laughs>